5K, Corinne, Helen, Tony, Marina Sveteva, born in Moscow in 1892, grew up in a cultured family. Her father was a professor and her mother a pianist. In 1912, Marina married Sergi Efron, a poet. During the famine, Marina put one of her daughters in an orphanage where the daughter died. Marina had affairs with the poets Osip Mandelstam and Sofia Parnoff. She made a living for many years as a writer, but she also suffered in poetry, in poverty. I guess it's the same thing. <laughs> Her husband, Sergi, was arrested in 1939 and later died in a camp. Marina hanged herself in 1941. Through all her struggles, she soared in the writing of poetry and other literary forms. Elaine Feinstein, who translated Marina Sveteva's selected poems that we are reading from today, wrote in the introduction, quote, her ruling passion was poetry and it came before everything else. She wrote, quote, I don't love life as such. If I were to be taken beyond the ocean into paradise and forbidden to write, I would refuse the ocean and paradise, end of quote. Marina Sveteva was one of the four top lyric poets in early 20th century Russia, along with Boris Pasternak, Anna Akhmatova, and Osip Mandelstam. Anna Akhmatova writes about Marina in there are four of us, which has a note underneath the title, O Muse of Weeping by Marina Sveteva. There are four of us. I have turned aside from everything, from the whole earthly store. The spirit and guardian of this place is an old tree stump in water. We are brief guests of the earth, as it were, and life is a habit we put on. On paths of air, I seem to overhear two friendly voices talking in turn. Did I say two? There, by the east wall's tangle of raspberry, is a branch of elder, dark and fresh. Why, it's a letter from Marina. Marina Sveteva's poems are personal, passionate, and illuminating. The splendid readers, in order of their appearance, are Kay Wiseman, Corinne Conley, Helen Richman, Tony Sawyer. Here's Kay Wiseman. What is this gypsy passion for separation? What is this gypsy passion for separation? This readiness to rush off when we've just met? My head rests in my hands as I realize looking into the night that no one turning over our letters has yet to understand how completely and how deeply faithless we are, which is to say, how true we are to ourselves. We shall not escape hell. We shall not escape hell, my passionate sisters. We shall drink black resins, we who sang our praises to the Lord with every one of our sinews, even the finest. We did not lean over candles or cradles or spinning wheels at night, and now we are carried off by an unsteady boat under the skirts of a sleeveless cloak. Slovenly women, needlewomen, all our sewing came apart. Dancers, players upon pipes. We have been the queens of the whole world. First, scarcely covered by rags, then with constellations in our hair, in jail, and at feasts we have bartered away heaven. In starry nights, in the apple orchards of paradise, gentle girls, my beloved sisters, we shall certainly find ourselves in hell. I'm glad your sickness. 
I'm glad your sickness is not caused by me. Mine is not caused by you. I'm glad to know the heavy earth will never flow away from us beneath our feet. And so we can relax together and not watch our words. When our sleeves touch, we shall not drown in waves of rising blush. I'm glad to see you calmly now embrace another girl in front of me without any wish to cause me pain, as you don't burn if I kiss someone else. I know you never use my tender name, my tender spirit, day or night. And no one in the silence of a church will sing their hallelujahs over us. Thank you for loving me like this. For you feel love, although you do not know it. Thank you for the nights I've spent in quiet. Thank you for the walks under the moon you've spared me and those sunset meetings unshared. Thank you. The sun will never bless our heads. Take my sad thanks for this. You do not cause my sickness, and I do not cause yours. No one has taken anything away. No one has taken anything away. There is even a sweetness for me in being apart. I kiss you now across the many hundreds of miles that separate us. I know our gifts are unequal, which is why my voice is quiet for the first time. What can my untutored verse matter to you, a young Dershavian? For your terrible flight, I give you blessing. Fly then, young eagle. You have stared into the sun without blinking. Can my young gaze be too heavy for you? No one has ever stared more tenderly or more fixedly after you. I kiss you across hundreds of separating years. Where does this tenderness come from? Where does this tenderness come from? These are not the first curls I have stroked slowly. The lips I have known are darker than yours. As stars rise often and go out again, where does this tenderness come from? So many eyes have risen and died out in front of these eyes of mine. And yet, no such song have I heard in the darkness of night before. Where does this tenderness come from? Here, on the ribs of the singer. Where does this tenderness come from? And what shall I do with it? Young, sly singer, just passing by. Your lashes are longer than anyone's. Bent with worry. Bent with worry, God paused to smile. And look, there were many holy angels with bodies of the radiance he had given them, some with enormous wings and others without any, which is why I weep so much, because even more than God, even more than God himself, I love his fair angels. Today or tomorrow, the snow will melt. Today or tomorrow, the snow will melt. You lie alone beneath an enormous fur. Shall I pity you? Your lips have gone dry forever. Your drinking is difficult. Your step heavy. Every passerby hurries away from you. 
Was it with fingers like yours that Rogerson clutched the garden knife? And the eyes, the eyes in your face, two circles of charcoal, year-old circles. Surely when you were still young, your girl lured you into a joyless house. Far away in the night, over asphalt, a cane. Doors swing open into night under beating wind. Come in, appear, undesired guest, into my chamber, which is most bright. Poems for Akmatoba. Muse of Lament. You are the most beautiful of all muses, a crazy emanation of white night. And you have sent a black snowstorm all over Russia. We are pierced with the arrows of your cries, so that we shy like horses at the muffled, many times uttered pledge, Ah, Anna Akhmatova. The name is a vast sigh, and it falls into depths without name. And we wear crowns only through stamping the same earth as you, with the same sky over us. Whoever shares the pain of your deathly power will lie down immortal upon his deathbed. In my melodious town, the domes are burning, and the blind wanderer praises our shining Lord. I give you my town of many bells, Akhmatova, with the gift, my heart. Four. You block out everything, even the sun at its highest. Hold all the stars in your hand. If only through some wide open door, I could blow like the wind to where you are. And starting to stammer, suddenly blushing, could lower my eyes before you and fall quiet in tears as a child sobs to receive forgiveness. In Poems for Block, a series poem, sections four and seven are missing and six is out of sequence. That is the way that the translator, Elaine Feinstein, laid it out. I will read it the way she chose to present it. Poems for Block. One. Your name is a bird in my hand, a piece of ice on the tongue, one single movement of the lips. Your name is five signs, a ball caught in flight, a silver bell in the mouth, a stone Cast in a quiet pool makes the splash of your name, and the sound is in the clatter of night hooves, loud as a thunderclap, or it speaks straight into my forehead, shrill as the click of a cocked gun. Your name, how impossible. It is a kiss in the eyes on motionless eyelashes, chill and sweet. Your name is a kiss of snow, a gulp of icy spring water, blue as a dove. Above your name is sleep. Two, tender, specter, blameless as a night, who has called you into my adolescent life in blue, dark, gray, and priestly, you stand here dressed in snow. And it's not the wind that drives me through the town now, no. This is the third night I felt the old enemy. 
with light blue eyes. His magic has bound me, that snowy singer. Swan of snow, under my feet, he spreads his feathers. Hovering feathers, slowly they dip in the snow. Thus upon feathers I go towards the door, which behind which is death. He sings to me behind the blue windows. He sings to me as jeweled bells. Long is the shout from his swan's beak as he calls. Dear specter of mist, I know this is dreaming. So one favor now do for me. Amen. Of dispersing. Amen. Amen. Three. You are going west of the sun now. You will see there evening light. You are going west of the sun, and snow will cover up your tracks. Past my windows, passionless, you are going in quiet snow. Saint of God, beautiful, you are the quiet light of my soul. But I do not long for your spirit. Your way is indestructible, and your hand is pale from holy kisses, no nail of mine. By your name, I shall not call you. My hands shall not stretch after you to your holy waxen face. I shall only bow from afar. Standing under the slow falling snow, I shall fall to my knees in the snow. In your holy name, I shall only kiss that evening snow, where with majestic pace you go by in tomb-like quiet, the light of quiet, holy glory of it, keeper of my soul. At home, five, in Moscow, where the domes are burning, at home in Moscow, in the sound of bells where I live, the tombs in their rows are standing, and in them Zarichas are asleep and czars. And you don't know how at dawn the Kremlin is the easiest place to breathe in the whole wide earth, and you don't know when dawn reaches the Kremlin. I pray to you until the next day comes. And I go with you by your river, Neva, even while beside the Moscow River I am standing here with my head lowered and the line of streetlights sticks fast together. With my insomnia, I love you wholly. With my insomnia, I listen for you. Just at the hour throughout, the Kremlin men who ring the bells begin to waken. Still my river and your river, still my hand and your hand will never join. Or not until one dawn catches up another dawning. Eight. And the gadflies gather about indifferent cart horses. The red calico of Kaluga puffs out in the wind. It is a time of whistling quails and huge skies. Bells waving over waves of corn and more talk about Germans than anyone can bear. Now yellow, yellow, beyond the blue trees is a cross and a sweet fever, a radiance over everything. Your name sounding like angel. Nine. A weak shaft of light through the blackness of hell is your voice under the rumble of exploding shells. In that thunder like a seraph, he is announcing in a toneless voice from somewhere else. Some ancient misty morning he inhabits. How he loved us who are blind and nameless, who share the blue cloak of sinful treachery and more tenderly than anyone loved the woman who sank more daringly than any into the night of evil and of his love for you, Russia, which he cannot end. And he draws an absent-minded finger along his temple. All the time he tells us of the days that wait for us, how God will deceive us. We shall call for the sun and it will not rise. 
He spoke like a solitary prisoner, or perhaps a child speaking to himself, so that over the whole square, the sacred heart of Alexander Block appeared to us. Thinking him human, they decided to kill him. And now he's dead forever. Weep for the dead angel. At the day's setting, he sang the evening beauty. Three waxen lights now shudder superstitiously. And lines of light, hot strings across the snow come from him. Three waxen candles to the sun, the light bearer. Oh, now look how dark his eyelids are fallen. Oh, now look how his wings are broken. The black reciter reads, the people idly stamp. Dead lies the singer and celebrates resurrection. Ten. Look, there he is, weary from foreign parts, a leader without bodyguard. There, he is drinking a mountain stream from his hands, a prince without native land. He has everything in his holy princedom there, army, bread, and mother. Lovely is your inheritance. Govern, friend, without friends. A kiss on the head. A kiss on the head wipes away misery. I kiss your head. A kiss on the eyes takes away sleeplessness. I kiss your eyes. A kiss on the lips quenches the deepest thirst. I kiss your lips. A kiss on the head wipes away memory. I kiss your head. Yesterday, he still looked in my eyes. <clears throat> Yesterday, he still looked in my eyes. Yet today, his looks are bent aside. Yesterday, he sat here until the birds began. But today, all those larks are ravens, stupid creature, and you are wise. You live while I am stunned. Now, for the lament of women in all times, my love, what was it I did to you? And tears are water, blood is water. A woman always washes in blood and tears. Love is a stepmother and no mother. Then expect no justice or mercy from her. Ships carry away the ones we love. Along the white road they are taken away. And one cry stretches across the earth. My love, what was it I did to you? Huh, yesterday, he lay at my feet. He even compared me with the Chinese empire. Then suddenly, he let his hands fall open and my life fell out like a rusty kopeck. A child murderer, before some court I stand, loathsome and timid I am. And yet, even in hell, I shall demand, my love, what was it I did to you? I asked the chair, I asked the bed, why? Why do I suffer and live in penury? His kisses stopped, he wanted to break you, to kiss another girl is their reply. <laughs> he taught me to live in fire, he threw me there and then abandoned me on steps of ice. My love, I know what you have done to me. My love, what was it 
I did to you. I know everything, don't argue with me. I can see now, I am no lover no longer. And now I know wherever love holds power, death approaches soon like a gardener. It is almost like shaking a tree. In time, some ripe apple comes falling down. So, for everything, for everything, forgive me, my love. Whatever it was I did to you. The Poet. A poet's speech begins a great way off. A poet is carried far away by speech, by way of planets, signs, and the ruts of roundabout parables between yes and no. In his hands, even sweeping gestures from a bell tower become hook-like. For the way of comets is the poet's way, and the blown apart links of causality are his links. Look up after him without hope. The eclipses of poets are not foretold in the calendar. He is the one that mixes up the cards and confuses. Arithmetic and weight demands answers from the school bench, the one who altogether refutes can't. The one in the stone graves of the Bastille, who remains like a tree in its loveliness, and yet the one whose traces have always vanished, the train everyone always arrives too late to catch. For the path of comets is the path of poets. They burn without warming, pick without cultivating, they are an explosion, a breaking in, and the mane of their path makes the curve of a graph cannot be foretold by the calendar. Two, there are superfluous people about in this world, out of sight, who aren't listed in any directory, and home for them is a rubbish heap. They are hollow, jostled creatures who keep silent, dumb as dumb. They are nails catching in your silken hem, dirt imagined under your wheels. Here they are, ghostly and invisible. The sign is on, like the speck of the, of the leper. People like Job in this world, who might even have envied him, if... We are poets, which has the sound of outcast. Nevertheless, we step out from our shores. We dare contend for Godhead with goddesses and for the virgin with the gods themselves. Now, what shall I do here, blind and fatherless? Everyone else can see and has a father. Passion in this world has to leap anathema as it might be over the walls of a trench, and weeping is called a cold in the head. What shall I do by nature and trade, a singing creature, like a wire, sunburn, Siberia, as I go over the bridge of my enchanted visions that cannot be weighed in a world that deals only in weights and measures? What shall I do, singer and firstborn, in a world where the deepest black is gray and inspiration is kept in a thermos? With all this immensity in a measured world? You loved me. You loved me. And your lies had their own probity. There was a truth in every falsehood. Your love went far beyond any possible boundary, as no one else's could. 
Your love seemed to last even longer than time itself. Now you wave your hand and suddenly your love for me is over. That is the truth in five words. My ear attends to you. My ear attends to you. As a mother hears in her sleep, to a feverish child, she whispers as I bend over you. At the skin, my blood calls out to your heart. My whole sky craves an island of tenderness. My rivers tilt towards you, and I am drawn downwards as stairs slope into a garden or some willow's bough falls straight down away from the milestone. Stars are pulled to the earth and laurels on graves one with suffering attract banners and owl longs for a hollow. And I lean down towards you with muscle and wing as if to a grave stone I put the ears to sleep. My lips seek yours like spring. I opened my veins. I opened my veins. Unstoppably, life spurts out with no remedy. Now I set out bowls and plates. Every bowl will be shallow. Every plate will be small and overflowing their rims into the black earth to nourish the rushes unstoppably without cure, gushes poetry. Epitaph. Just going out for a minute, left your work, which the idol call chaos, behind on the table and left the chair behind when you went where? I ask around all Paris, for it's only in stories or pictures that people rise to the skies. Where is your soul gone? In the cupboard, too doored like a shrine, look, all your books are in place, and each line the letters are there. Where has it gone to? Your face, your face, your warmth, your shoulder. Where did they go? Useless with eyes, like nails to penetrate the black soil. As true as a nail in the mind, you're not here, not here. It's useless turning my eyes and fumbling around the sky. Rain, pails of rainwater, but you are not there, not there. Neither one of the two. Bone is too much bone. The spirit is too much spirit. Where is the real you? All of you, too much here, too much there, and I won't exchange you for sand and stream. You took me for kin, and I won't give you up for a corpse and a ghost, a here and a there. It's not you, not you, not you. However much priests intone that death and life are one, God's too much God, worm, too much worm. You are one thing, corpse and spirit. He won't give you up for the smoke of the censers or flowers or graves. If you are anywhere, it's here in us. And we honor best all those who have gone by despising division. It is all of you that has gone. Because once, when you were young and bold and 
did not leave me to rot alive among bodies without souls or fall dead among walls. I will not let you die altogether because fresh and clean, you took me out by the hand to freedom and brought spring leaves and bundles into my house. I shall not let you be grown over with the weeds and forgotten. And because you met the status of my first gray hairs like a son with pride, greeting their terror with a child's joy, I shall not let you go gray into men's hearts. The blow, muffled through years of forgetting, of not knowing, the blow that reaches me now like the song of a woman or like horses neighing, through an inert building, a song of passion, and the blow comes, dulled by forgetfulness, by not knowing which is a soundless thicket. It is a son of memory, the sin of memory, which has no eyes or lips or flesh or nose. The stills of all the days and nights we have been without each other. The blow is muffled with moss and water weed. So ivy devours the core of the living thing it is ruining. A knife through a feather bed. Window wadding, our ears are plugged with it and with that other wool outside windows of snow, the weight of spiritless years and the blow is muffled. Desk, my desk, most loyal friend, thank you. You've been with me on every road I've taken, my scar and my protection, my loaded writing mule. Your tough legs have endured the weight of all my dreams and burdens of piled up thoughts. Thank you for toughening me. No worldly joy could pass your severe looking glass. You blocked the first temptation and every base desire. Your heavy oak outweighed lions of hate, elephants of spite. You intercepted, and thank you for growing with me. As my need grew in size, I've been laid out across you so many years, alive, while you've grown broad and wide and overcome age. Yes, however my mouth opens, you stretch out limitless. You've nailed me to your wood. I'm glad to be pursued and torn up, at first light to be caught and commanded. Fugitive, back to your chair. I'm glad you've guarded me and bent my life away from blessings that don't last, as wizards guide sleepwalkers. My battles burn as signs. You even use my blood to set out all my acts in lines, in columns, as you are a pillar of light. My source of power, you led me as the Hebrews once were led forward by fire. Take blessings now from me as one put to the test on elbows, forehead, knotted knees, your knife edge to my breast. I celebrate 30 years of union, truer than love. I know every notch in your wood. You know the lines on my face. Haven't you written from there, devouring reams of paper, denying me any tomorrow, teaching me only today? You've thrown my important letters and money in floods together, repeating for every single verse, today has to be the deadline. You've warned me of retribution, not to be measured in spoonfuls, 
and when my body will be laid out. Great fool, let it be on you then. The rest of you can eat me up. I just record your behavior. For you, they'll find dining tables to lay you out. This desk is for me. Because I've been happy with little. There are foods I've never tasted. The rest of you dine slowly. You've eaten too much and too often. Places are always chosen long before birth for everyone. The place of adventure is settled and the places of gratification. Truffles for you, not pencils. Pickles instead of dactyls. And you express your pleasure in belches and not in verses. At your head, funeral candles must be thick-legged asparagus. Surely your road from the world will cross a dessert table. Let's puff Havana's tack. Let's puff Havana tobacco on either side of you then, and let your shreds be made from the finest of Dutch linen. And so, as not to waste such fine cloth, let them shake you with leftovers and crumbs into the grave that waits for you. Your souls at the post-mortem will be like stuffed capons. But I shall be there, naked, with only two wings for cover. An attempt at jealousy. How is your life with that other one? Simpler is it? A stroke of the oars and a long coastline and the memory of me is soon a drifting island, not in the ocean, in the sky. Souls, you will be sisters, sisters, not lovers. How is your life with an ordinary woman without the God inside her? The queen supplanted. How do you breathe now? Flinch, waking up? What do you do, poor man? Hysterics and interruptions enough, I'll rent my own house. <laughs> How is your life with that other, you my own? Is the breakfast delicious? If you get sick, don't blame me. How is it living with a postcard? You who stood on Sinai. How's your life with a tourist on earth? Her rib, do you love her? How's is it to your liking? How's life, do you cough? Do you hum to drown out the mice in your mind? How do you live with cheap goods? Is the market rising? How's kissing plaster dust? Are you bored with her new body? How's it going with an earthly woman with no sixth sense? Are you happy? No. In a shallow pit, how is your life, my beloved, hard as mine with another man? I am happy living simply. I am happy living simply like a clock or a calendar Worldly pilgrim, thin, wise as any creature. To know the spirit is my beloved. To come to things swift as a ray of light or a look. To live as I write, spare the way God asks me. And friends do not. Sweet companions sharing your bunk and your bed. 
Our sweet companions, sharing your bunk and your bed, the verse and the verse and the verse, and a hunk of your bread, the wheels endless round, the rivers streaming to ground, the road. Oh, the heavenly, the gypsy, the early dawn light. Remember the breeze in the morning, the step silver bright, wisps of blue smoke from the rise, and the song of the wise gypsies are. In the dark midnight, under the ancient trees shroud, we gave you suns as perfect as night, suns as poor as the night, and the nightingale churred your might. We never stopped you, companions for marvelous hours, poverty's passions, the impoverished meals we shared, the fierce bonfires glow, and there on the carpet below fell stars. Poems for Moscow. From my hands, take this city not made by hands, my strange, beautiful brother. Take it church by church, all 40 times 40 churches, and flying up the roofs, the small pigeons, and spasky gates, and gates, and gates, where the Orthodox take off their hats, and the chapel of stars, refuge chapel, where the floor is polished by tears. Take the circle of the five cathedrals, my coal, my soul, the domes watch us in their dark gold. And on your shoulders, from the red clouds, the mother of God will drop her own thin coat. And you will rise, happened of wonder powers, never ashamed you loved me. Oh, what a fabulous, emotional reading, vulnerable, what a range she has. It, you know, these poems that you ladies read, it's almost like I feel these things in my life, you know, over a hundred years ago and the tenderness and her understanding of relationships and her, it's almost like there's no separation between her, the soul and God, and even the, uh, you know, the great elements, the stars at, as, uh, you know, recently read about the stars on the carpet. I mean, it's just, everything is just so here, right here and now. And the poetry is so accessible and just so emotionally charged and intellectually charged. We have about seven minutes left. Uh, let's just take a few minutes and talk about the poetry or the poet or the reading. And let's start with Corinne since she's up and then just uh, go around the room. Well, so, uh, all, so much of the emotions that we talk about in these poems, of course, are still with us. But I can't help but feel the harshness of the life that she led. So unlike our own, <laughs> we've all maybe had problems, but uh, Akhmatova uh, and, uh, and that, um, now say her name, Tavia, I mean, they were during the Russian Revolution, and and, uh, and this poet, you know, lost a child in an orphanage. I mean, what? And and then at the end of her life, she hung herself. I mean, we have to be aware of what a different life that she had lived in the harshness of her life, and to be able to write beautiful thoughts. And and spiritual things and uh, uh, living a life that <clears throat> I think that we really can't comprehend in our, in our in the way we live now. I agree with you, Corinne. And I read one paragraph in the introduction by Elaine Feinstein where she was talking about how uh, Marina was asked to give a reading in another town, and she didn't even have a coat or a dress, just the one dress wool dress she'd been worried all been wearing all winter long and she had to borrow a dress from a friend and later 
it said in that same paragraph that she ate horse meat at time. And, you know, she made, like some of these poets, they made a living for a while, and then they were not allowed to make a living anymore. So, you know, just suffering all that poverty. So that's a well-spoken uh, point, uh, Corinne. I agree exactly with you. And it makes us makes me feel that what we go through here is somewhat minor compared to the horrors that they lived through. Uh, Helen, what would you like to add? Um, well, I do find uh, it um, different uh, to have a poet um, be able to express both um, the utter passion um, of of her her love and her her desire to to be with someone and yet there is a terrific uh, spirituality she refers to resurrection and she um, talks about the soul and um, so she she has this God feeling um, and yet uh, she in real life she hung herself and in her poems, um, she is uh, a, really a victim of um, the utter, utter passion that she feels. It's both being a victim and then, of course, as a poet, in a way, it's a blessing because when you write, you're writing such beautiful, um, deep felt things. But I can't help but think that her life must have been uh, to be this passionate and yet to feel that there is God must have been a very, very difficult um, kind of thinking in, on her part. And also the, the uh, position of the poet in Russia, you know, Russia being uh, really such a soulful country and, and they really didn't get to the rational as much as the West did. And, and the poet was always held very high pushkin was held at a higher level than, you know, some of the writers in prose at that time, Dostoevsky and others, they always valued the poets. And even, you know, uh, who was it, Osip Mandelstam, you know, in one of his poems, he referred to, you know, he was, it was a poem about Stalin, he used the word cockroach for, you know, his mustache, and he ended up in Siberia where he was killed. So the word meant a lot here in the United States. I mean, we can really, say anything, it doesn't mean we won't get a you know kickback for what we say, but it's not a life or death matter. It might be economically a life or death matter, but in Russia, it really was a serious offense, uh, the word, if it wasn't used to the dictator's, you know, uh, favor. Uh, what do you, what would you like to add, um, Tony? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I have it on the floor, but there's, one poem I read where she she opened her veins. I think that was it. And I feel that she it's her poetry. She lives her poetry. She has to do this. I I think she's a survivor. I don't I never I don't see her as a victim. Um, all the affairs she had and the men and so forth. This is really only. Maybe because she felt that, that she should do that. She, she was trying to reach out for other people, to be with other people, but yet it was her poetry that flowed through her veins. And I think that was what kept her alive. And then when she hung herself, and that's, that's the question I'm wondering about. If, she, if that was so important to her, her poetry, why would she stop that? Suddenly, maybe she, maybe that, that was hanging herself as a mark of saying, I'm, I'm just not going to live like this anymore or something. That's kind of what I feel. She's, she's a, a survivor and she's put all her life into her veins, so to speak. Well said. And uh, we have about a minute left. Kay, if you're there, what would you like to say? Well, everything's been said, ex except that I would just like to say about the sadness of her death, when the richness of her words, I mean, what more could she have written about 
and what did we lose by her death and how, how terrible it must have been at that point in her life that she could not go on and that, that, that her talent and her artistry couldn't feed her enough to carry her on. It's uh, mm. very, very sad, sad, and s such beautiful work. I was very touched by, by all of the poems. Lovely. Jennifer, thank you all. Thank you all for a marvelous reading. Phoebe McAdams sent a little uh, chat. She said she was being forced by the Soviets to be a spy. That is why she said she killed herself. But my wife went to a psychologist for many years, and she asked her psychologist, why do people commit suicide? And she said, sometimes people just can't stand the pain anymore. Mm -hmm. but, uh, thank you all for a wonderful reading. And here's Jennifer. Thank you guys. That was, um, the poetry was wonderful, but the interpretation is what really brought it to life today. And thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Um, do you want to tease what's happening next week, Harry? Next week, we're celebrating the Hispanic Heritage Month, Bob Beecher's idea. And we'll have a wide range of great past poets and great new poets. So it should be a wonderful tribute.